opening of the now uh, Meissen exhibition, the wonderful exhibition. And at that uh, situation, I've also seen the newly installed collection of the Wawel, which is really very, very nicely installed. And also I've uh, seen the catalogue of the Rota Gapris. Um, my name is Katharina Hanschmann and I'm the curator of the uh, ceramic department at the Bavarian National Museum in Munich, you see here in the picture. And I will also talk about the Ernst Schneider bequest in Lustheim Castle, a little bit outside of Munich, you see on the lower right, and we will talk about Lustheim later on. The Meissen collection in Munich, uh, the Bavarian National Museum, has been founded by King, the Bavarian ruler, King Max II, in 1855. That means in a period when the residence was still used by himself as a residence. But he founded that museum to show the, show the pride of the Bavarian people and gave all he had in his um, residence, and he did not need, to the newly founded museum. Therefore, we have very, very rich possessions, especially because the Bavarian rulers started to rule in 1180, that means more than 800 years ago, and had always been connected, related, uh, married with uh, the family of the emperor, with the kings of Spain and Poland, with also with Italy and France, and therefore they always bought the very, very best pieces of the period or got many things also as a present. And all these pieces, many pieces, were given then to the Bavarian National Museum, which moved into the building where we are nowadays in 1900. It's like a castle, a huge uh, castle-like building. And uh, be, be, uh, in all these uh, belongings, uh, there are with much ivory, some of them even uh, worked by the uh, electors and the kings themselves. And they are lightened like this, so you can see the quality of the ivory. Then there is a silver collection, a glass collection, and also a costume collection. Many, many of the objects we know, costume collection again. Many of the objects we know exactly to whom of the electors uh, it belonged to or where it was exposed. Here you see the huge uh, porcelain collection, most of all here is Nymphenburg porcelain, that means a Munich manufactory, but especially important is our Meissen collection. It has been divided, the Meissen collection of the Wittelsbach family, of the ruling family, has been divided into the Bavarian National Museum, which you can see here, and the Munich residence because the directors of the Bavarian National Museum in the 19th century did not choose all objects. For example, of these vast garniture, they ch have chosen always the middle piece only, and the rest was left in the residence. And that doesn't make much sense, so we exchanged pieces, and nowadays in our newly installed galleries, you see the vases, one garniture of vases together, the yellow ones, and the other garniture is in the residence to be seen. The reason why the Meissen porcelain is so important in the Wittelsbach family is because the uh, prince elector Karl Albrecht, who later on became even emperor, the only emperor not Habsburg family in modern times, and he had already much appreciated porcelain because he knew that his great-grandfather, Maximilian I, had already porcelain uh, around 1600. These were amongst the first objects that came from China to Europe. And there is even, as you can see below, 
one huge, huge dish with the coat of arms of Bavaria. That means that uh, it was not only that they bought some things, but the Spanish rulers ordered these dishes, especially for the Bavarian court. Then the, grand, the father of Karl Albrecht, he uh, lived quite a time in Paris and ordered there these Chinese and Japanese porcelains with French silver and silver gilt mounts which are very singular because all the silver mounts in France have been melted down during the French Revolution. Therefore, the, the pieces here in Munich are very special and, and seldom. And he got most a lot of Meissen porcelain after his wedding. He married in 1722 Maria Amalia from the Habsburg family. She was the daughter, you see the couple on the right hand side, she was the daughter of Emperor Joseph I. And you know her elder sister very well because she is Maria Josefa, the wife of Augustus III, King of Poland, the son of Augustus the Strong, and uh, who had married three years before the son exactly of Augustus the third, uh, the, the strong. In 1719, the huge, huge famous wedding, which took place for four weeks. The same was the case in Munich three weeks, uh, years later in 1722, the second daughter, Maria Amalia. And the Saxony, the sister of in Saxony ordered, or, or the, his her family, ordered porcelain to give as a wedding present to Munich. We know this from archive material. So in 1722 already, that means 12 years after the foundation of Meissen porcelain and um, the porcelain manufactory and two years after uh, Herold has arrived in Meissen and started with colored Meissen porcelain, with the painting on porcelain, Already then, two years later, arrived the first pieces to Munich. And at that time, when the wedding was uh, organized in Vienna and uh, uh, negotiated, the ambassador from Bavaria also ordered in Vienna porcelain. The very, very, at the newly founded Dupacier manufactory, these objects also in Munich, uh, are part of the first table dinner service of European porcelain because at that time Meissen was not able to produce it yet. But I said already, for the wedding they got then Meissen porcelain and it must be among what, what has uh, survived, probably these beakers or this little equel um, with an early, early painting because the next pieces, which can be, must be dated in 1723 already, like this tea service, where the sugar box and the tea um, uh, pot have the KPM uh, mark, which can be dated in 1723. And you see how wonderfully they are painted with chinoiserie uh, scenes and the whole building. There are altogether four of these tea services left in Munich. And from archive material, we know that they were already in Munich in the 18th century. They were all exposed in this way on a silver gilt um, uh, basin and, uh, uh, each, uh, and also little basins for each vessel itself. Like this, it was exposed, two of them were exposed even in the rich apartments, in the, uh, the newly installed rich apartments in the Munich residence. Uh, as you can see here with all the pictures on the right hand side on tables, they are, were exposed like this, as we know from uh, the inventory, and they are exposed like this again nowadays. And the other two were in the private apartments of the ladies, the uh, electress. That 
means that uh, they really appreciated a lot the Meissen porcelain because in these rich uh, representative apartments, which were newly installed at that period, uh, only Chinese porcelain normally was installed, Chinese porcelain with mounts, with silver gilt mounts on very important uh, furniture as well, as you can see here. And that among all this also, Meissen porcelain ex is exposed, shows the appreciation towards Meissen porcelain as well. Uh, in later times, then uh, other Meissen porcelain came to Munich, especially when Wilhelmine Amalia, the mother of the two daughters, died in 1742. And her possessions were divided in two parts, and the elder sister, uh, Maria Josefa, in Dresden, said, oh, all the porcelain I do not need because uh, I have enough, I give all my, I would prefer to have the paintings. And that's why much porcelain has arrived in Munich. And there is also a list of all the pieces. Amongst them, for example, this garniture of seven vases, very interestingly, of different colors. And we know also it was given in 1732 by Augustus III to his mother-in-law, when they met in Neuhaus in Bohemia. And also the very famous toilet garniture of the dowager, that means the empress, uh, widow and empress, with the coat of arms of uh, the empire. And uh, for example, also some of these birds, rather huge birds, or this uh, barrel for liquor, uh, was also on the list and is still in the Bavaria National Museum. And then also this table fountain for rose water, where you can put the rose water in the shell and it comes out of the mouth of the fish with a tap, of course. So you have some, some uh, little drops of water, of rose perfumed water to wash your, to, to, to have uh, some water on your hand and this uh, enormously wonderfully painted um, facing. And moreover, uh, there are other pieces as well, but the most perhaps impressionating and unique, really unique uh, set of porcelain is this um, service. Porcelain service completely gilded with gold decorated the gold decoration was made in augsburg the huge augsburg the huge silver um uh, city with many 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 silversmiths and there were two families working one is the Seuter family who decorated on mice and porcelain and it's unique because you won't find uh, other pieces like this anywhere else. It's, it's exposed like this in the Bavaria National Museum in the room dedicated to Emperor Charles uh, um, VII. That is the one who married in 1722. All his life, actually, we can say, he uh, reinstalled the Munich residence to show that he is really worth to become an emperor, which was possible after the death of Charles VI, who had only a daughter, Maria uh, Theresa. And you see that it's all crack porcelain, Chinese porcelain, and I've chosen especially uh, a piece where the gold has wrapped off, and it's incised, the etching incised, after, and you can see here one other dish where the uh, date 1732 can be easily seen. Um, and the etching, or you could actually say the polishing, because it's just different type of polishing which makes the design into the gold. Uh, it, it is made after engravings of Johann Elias Riedinger, the famous engraver of Augsburg, who was related with the Seuter family 
and perhaps worked with them also and not only gave the engravings. And you see a, another engraving. It's all, These are all hunting scenes where the deer is hunted and people are watching. And there are also smaller dishes, which were not Chinese porcelain, but Meissen porcelain, with the polished scene of uh, chinoiserie again, which uh, all the pieces in front are uh, Meissen porcelain, all the pieces in back, uh, the, the huge dishes, and also the bowls are Chinese porcelain. And you won't find something like this somewhere else. The only thing what you find is uh, dishes where the blue of the or, uh, original painting is surrounded by gold. And so you have a, a cobalt uh, gold uh, uh, effect. Well, the Seuter family has work is much more known for the, their um, gold chinoiserie decoration on white Meissen porcelain, such as those which are, come also from the Munich residence, and you have other pieces like this also in Krakow, and which uh, have these engravings uh, were probably inspiring these Augsburg engravings. I said already in the Munich residence, uh, you have this gold service and you have the second service where the blue can be seen uh, together with the gold, um, which are of course very, very precious as well. And this time here you have some more of the pieces which have survived. And the only, uh, this type where the blue and the gold works together, this can be found in not many places, but uh, in one place with a, a large amount, which is this in Florence. Here you have the at the Palazzo Pitti in Florence, Chinese porcelain decorated, it's over decorated uh, with gold. And you have also uh, Meissen porcelain, also at the Palazzo Pitti in the little castle. Uh, up uh, uh, at the Boboli Garden, where you have also Meissen porcelain, where the gold uh, and the blue comes together, but you won't find anywhere else a complete gilded service. What uh, Karl Albrecht intended, of course, is to show this on a buffet, to show it to his guests. And he wanted to intend that, uh, of course, at the empire, Emperor want, needed to have silver gilt vessels to serve his uh, meal on it, as you can see on this painting, which shows the wedding of the later Joseph II Emperor um, together with Isabella and, uh, of Parma. So this gold is the material which is uh, which belongs to the emperor and that's what he wanted to show because he was just prince elector one of the eight prince electors who elected the emperor but he wanted to show that he is worth worthy to become the next emperor with this gold service when you come closer you even see the all the etching in it and just absolutely astonished and perhaps after a while when you look inside the the, uh, uh, the cups you will realize that it's porcelain and you are even more astonished because this material you can't melt it down in case you need money for a war so it's showing a richness in even a more sublime way than when you have real uh, precious metal as a service. Well, then Meissen porcelain came also to Munich a generation later because the two sisters, Maria Amalia and Maria Josepha, decided, or well, they that their sons and daughters should marry each other. There was a double wedding in 1747, and you probably know Frederick Christian from Saxony, who my, married a Bavarian princess, Maria Antonia, and the already young elector of Bavaria, Max III, Joseph, married Maria Anna from Saxony. 
Uh, here you can see uh, again the two Bavarians in, lighted in blue. And at that wedding in 1747, we know, Ma Ma Maureen Cassidy Geiger has published it, that it was one of the very first occasions that on the royal table there was also porcelain figures standing there. So porcelain was the most beautiful, most uh, interesting material at that time. And when, uh, for example, uh, a porcelain temple like this, and these figures which can be seen in uh, Lustheim Castle as well, were on the table. And uh, when the Bavarian elector, as a young man, came to Dresden to uh, meet his uh, bride, he went the third day or the fifth day already to Meissen a whole day and was astonished and, and, and loved it so much. And he ordered 10 huge boxes of porcelain, which probably uh, this centerpiece, this lemon basket is one part of it. And also these um, dishes in form of leaves. And also at that time came to Munich um, as a huge centerpiece uh, in white, the Apollo, um, the, 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 no, the, the decision of Paris, who is the most beautiful wife, Helen, uh, um, Athene or Hera, the three goddesses. And in the back of this uh, photo, this is exposed in the Munich residence. When you come to Munich, you definitely have to go to both places, to the Munich residence and to the Bavarian National Museum. And when you see in the uh, back, you will see um, uh, here that uh, it's not all porcelain. All the architecture, the, the fence uh, uh, items are made of sugar paste out of molds of wood that as you can see and uh, the, the, uh, the inside there are porcelain pieces in white exposed and you see how well this works together also the tree the huge tree is porcelain but all the fences are sugar paste at that time many many porcelains were white we know this also from inventories and um, were white, so that was uh, fine on the table as well, but more and more also colored pieces. I want to mention that uh, this second generation uh, of porcelain lovers, Max III Joseph, the young elector, uh, not was only uh, delighted by Meissen porcelain when he was in Meissen, but he wanted his own porcelain manufactory, which he founded in Munich. Uh, and you know, Nymphenburg, it, uh, the, it was first installed in a little other castle and then transferred to um, these buildings near the Nymphenburg summer palace of the Bavarian rulers. And the first they made was uh, this desert centerpiece uh, uh, um, with the uh, figures of, uh, of, of Nymphenburg porcelain. And the most famous um, centerpiece would be for the desert table was would be the Commedia dell'arte made by Franz Anton Bustelli, the modeler of the Nymphenburg manufactory, the most wonderful porcelain figures, I would say, nicer, more elegant than Meissen, I would say. Come to Munich and see it. Well, uh, but interesting enough is that he wanted his manufactory, he founded it and he gave money, but it took seven years until they were able to produce. Seven years, astonishing, because or he did not want to ask his father-in-law to uh, have uh, the knowledge to get uh, workers from Meissen to install, or the father-in-law would not want to give it to him. To, perhaps he did not want the, uh, the workers from Meissen because they were Protestant, and Bavaria was a very Catholic country, perhaps. Anyway, he asks in Vienna, and 
uh, only after seven years through the help of Josef Jakob Ringler from Vienna, who traveled at that time around 1753, 4, around in southern Germany and founded many other manufactories. And the Count Heimhausen helped a lot. But in, in between these seven years that they were not able to produce porcelain, they produced something else. They, because we know that they used money, they also used a kiln, but unfortunately at the beginning when the uh, workers from Vienna came, directly after the wedding, the technician, the man who knew how to make porcelain and to fire porcelain, he uh, uh, he died after two weeks. So there was a, a modeler and there was a, a, a painter, but uh, they were not able to produce porcelain. What they produced is terracotta. As you can see, this centerpiece with a uh, perforce hunt, and inside, from underneath, you see that it's terracotta and not fired very high. Uh, temperature because otherwise the sticks in metal inside would have melted down. But they are necessary to hold these um, uh, um, uh, formation that the, uh, the dog was running like this. And when you look closely, these are painted cold, in cold colors, in oil colors, but with much, much uh, care and very finely done with all the um, uh, points on the uh, horses' equipment and so on. And this is uh, what was done in Munich, and it was the way how they decorated also the sugar uh, decoration pieces on dessert tables, which were for many, many, well, centuries actually, uh, common at the courts. Probably you have heard about this, but uh, of course the sugar decoration uh, could not last for a long time. They were kept in the pan court pantry, uh, uh, but uh, after a while with all the insects in the kitchen and so on, uh, was, it became ugly and, and uh, smelly and uh, could not uh, persist. But with the, these terracotta figures, and that's why I wanted to show them to you, we have an imagine how these sugar decoration would have looked like, how uh, nicely they would have been decorated. Well, I, I just mentioned that in the Munich residence, we do have also historic Frankenthal porcelain from the Palatinate. The reason for that is that the Bavarian ruler, the one I, who founded the Nymphenburg manufactory and married the Saxon uh, pre uh, princess, did not have children. That's with him the, uh, the line of the Wittelsbach Bavarian rulers died. And another wing of the uh, Wittelsbach family, which had been divided almost 500 years before and ruled over the Palatinate. This uh, uh, line of Wittelsbach uh, family members took over in Bavaria the, the, the rule, uh, ruling and had to move to Bavaria and of course they had Bavaria and the Palatinate together, all the blue spots in the uh, map you can see Bavaria is a big uh, uh, spot <laughs> and was therefore so powerful because uh, Germany at that time was divided in many, many randoms, small, small randoms. Well, it was Karl Theodor from the Palatinate and of course he bring then with the time also all his Frankenthal porcelain to Munich and he bring also uh, the Sèvres porcelain service he got um, by King Louis the Fifteenth, Louis XV, uh, um, Gans, Louis XV uh, of France, uh, which is exposed like this on a table in the Munich residence and parts also in the Bavarian National Museum. He got this already in 1757. Well, now 
after all this puffos in uh, all this just porcelain we've seen in the Bavarian National Museum and in the Munich residence, all the historic uh, uh, um, porcelain, I went want to show you the second uh, another col huge collection of mice and porcelain, more than two thousand pieces exposed close to Munich in Lustheim Castle. Early mice and porcelain. The Lustheim Castle is situated in the um, park of Schleisheim, where there is, uh, like Nymphenburg, a summer residence of the uh, Bavarian rulers. You have in front uh, the Renaissance Castle, then the huge Versailles-like Baroque Castle, and at the end, the little Lustheim Castle, uh, which is also Baroque style, uh, built around 1685, actually also for a wedding with a daughter of an emperor. The uh, Bavarian rulers have married very often a daughter of an emperor, and that's the reason why they were so very important in, Bavar uh, in, in the Holy Roman Empire. And in this little castle at the end of the garden, uh, in 14 rooms, all these 2,000, more than 2,000 pieces are exposed. And these are all pieces also here downstairs in, uh, in the cellar, in the former room where, where the servants were waiting. And the collection is not a historic collection, but gathered by Dr. Ernst Schneider in all the 14 rooms. Dr. Ernst Schneider, born in 1900, was one of the very important industrialists after the Second World War. One man of the world um, economic wonder um, uh, after the Second World War. He was not in a party, but he was uh, very important because he gathered, um, he, he was moving from Dresden to, or, uh, to uh, Düsseldorf, where he lived, and he enjoyed so much porcelain and collecting porcelain. And he said he was very, very successful. Uh, he, uh, he he said, without collecting, I would not have been so successful. I was inspired by touching my porcelain. And what I like most is that he felt that uh, a successful person as him should uh, uh, feel the responsibility for the whole society. And therefore, he made many donations and engaged, he was um, uh, how do you say, uh, president of many societies. Um, and if, uh, he, he gave donations to install a medicine uh, faculty in, in Düsseldorf at the university to install different museums like the Kunst Museum in Düsseldorf, the theater there, and so on, and endlessly. And he also uh, was a founding member of the uh, um, Society of Ceramic Friends of Germany and gave the money to um, uh, publish the uh, journal Keramos, which is, uh, comes out four times a year with articles about porcelain, and it's nowadays still like this. So he is one of our great, great uh, founders, we can say. He lived in Düsseldorf, as I said before, and had in the castle, Jägerhof Castle, the upper floor, uh, installed with vitrines to show his uh, his uh, collection. And there he had this round table with politicians and industrialists to discuss informally uh, everything. Um, I was her I heard that he was even uh, proposed to be Chancellor of Bever of the uh, of Germany, but um, uh, this did not happen, of course. Anyway, it, it, this collection went became bigger and bigger. But uh, he, he he said, "I want a castle for myself to expose the whole uh, um, collection because all everything had to be somewhere in storage." So, uh, but Düsseldorf did not. <laughs> 
succeed in having a castle only for him because at that castle there is also a museum about the poet Goethe and uh, for the city museum and so on. And then he got in contact with Munich through the huge Meissen exhibition made in 1966, which was very famous at that time, the first huge exhibition after the World War II, and um, with a huge catalogue, which still is very reliable and um, sought after, uh, made by Rainer Rückert, my predecessor, uh, and uh, with him, he, dis he showed him Lustheim Castle and Ernst Schneider then decided at the age of 68 that he would give great part of his collection to Bavaria because Bavaria uh, promised him to install it at Lustheim Castle and actually also that he could live in the castle. I, you see now the si uh, side view of the castle and in the upper floor in the rooms he lived himself. Um, and all the pieces, well, the rest uh, of the uh, collection, most of all the porcelains of other manufacturers, of course, the silver and the furniture and so on, and also the Hausmaler pieces and also some Meissen pieces are left in, were, were left in Düsseldorf and exposed still there. Also a wonderful collection, but the biggest part and uh, all Meissen, early Meissen, were given to the Lustheim Castle, and it was <laughs> uh, like this for install them into the vitrines. And this is all porcelain, more than 2,000 pieces from the period of the beginning up to the end, the death of Augustus III, that means 1763, more or less. Uh, very few pieces from later periods. That means the very most important period of Meissen. And uh, when Schneider lived there, there was also this huge table in this main festive hall. Uh, here was uh, uh, where he had also guests to eat here. And he had a, a, a elevator to go up and down from his apartment. But of course, uh, vases put on a table is not very historical. Therefore, we have changed this and the table is now out. And we, this is the garniture of vases, which is wonderful. And now we have uh, these uh, uh, animals in the huge hall. And it shows the quality of this uh, the collection of mice and porcelain, uh, that there are four of these huge animals. It said that um, it is the best mice and collection after Dresden, of course. It, uh, the Schneider had five of uh, four of these huge animals, you know, from Dresden, uh, three in white and one even with colored soccer and uh, this uh, monkey. The collection has been published in part. Rückert has published these biographical dates of all Meissen manufacturists which is uh, full and full of content uh, taken out of the archive in Meissen, where he was able to go to all, uh, also already in the years before 1989. And there is a smaller book uh, with some the highlights in it published. And then we want to, we are about, well, actually Schneider wanted it and, uh, but and Rückert worked all the time on it, but did not publish the real volumes of the catalog, um, which should be six huge uh, books. And Julia Weber, the nowadays director of the porcelain collection in Dresden, she um, pub was working with us and, and the catalogs, which is also her dissertation, is so good that with this, she then finally became director interesting directly after the uh, publishing these uh, uh, two volumes 
These volumes have uh, perhaps a third in, in it with all the mice and porcelain with decorations after East Asian patterns. Of course, we have uh, quite some um, uh, uh, copies of this dragon, red dragon and phoenix service where you also have pieces I've seen. Um, this pattern is um, uh, preserved only to the ruler, the Saxon rulers and, and the, um, uh, the, the, the king of Poland. And we have also the pattern with the uh, lion, the yellow lion, um, uh, quite some pieces and other pieces in after Japan Kakemon style um, uh, decorations, um, which were, as you probably know, which were made all in a period around 1730 uh, for a French dealer, Le Maire, who asked to copy exactly these uh, objects and make the um, better no mark on it. But that was impossible, though. He said, oh, make the swords, which are not nice because they look like uh, a cross. So it would not. And anyway, uh, make them on glaze, not under glaze. And like the on glaze, he was able to take them off and sell these pieces as Japanese originals in France, where people paid a lot of money for. And but with the time, they realized that all this is described in the book of uh, Julia Weber. With the time, they realized that, um, uh, that there is a difference. And they discussed whether the copies in Meissen were worse or whether they could be accepted uh, the same way. So they were co copies. The question of copying and original was not so important at that time. But you know also that those pieces which were still in Meissen, when this all this came out, um, uh, Augustus III, no, Augustus the Strong was still, uh, decided all these pieces come to my a Japanese palace, and he had the incised numbers underneath made on these pieces, which are, is, are the inventory numbers of the Japanese palace. Um, I show now other pieces from our collections, and you will recognize quite some uh, related pieces in your collection in the uh, Wabel. For example, also the, all the discussions about these vases, which were the real original Japanese, and they were copied even with the Japanese sign underneath in Meissen and so on. Uh, Julia Weber has published in it in her book. And also this with this um, a strange animal taken, um, inventor, it was invented uh, animal fantasy fantasy animal and these kind of vases and this uh dish um in shape of a shell with a pattern and of course you also have uh, several of the incoronation service of the um the, uh, when uh augustus iii became king of poland and we have underglaze blue objects also with the AR uh, on top of it. And all these pieces are published in the book of uh, Julia Weber. Also these uh, uh, Imari style pattern where the underglaze blue with the onglaze colors are put together. And uh, there are also uh, copies after China in Fami Rose colors and Fami Noir colors or Fami Vert colors. This wonderful, wonderful vase comes from the Klemper collection. And already very early, um, we realized this and uh, we had uh, a, a contract with the Klemper family that we paid for it. So it could stay in Lustheim. And the same also now uh, the, from the Klemperer collection is this teapot. We also bought and gave money for it because we wanted to try to keep uh, together the Schneider collection. 
uh, in, on the other side, we gave back this dish to the Count Witztum uh, as the, this sign underneath, Vö, is the inventory sign of the Schönwölkau castle, which in the uh, period of the DDR, of the um, German, um, uh, 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 East German Republic, um, uh, was taken away, and uh, so with this sign, we can we are sure that it belonged to the family. Though there are many, many other dishes with exactly this uh, butterfly pattern without the uh, inventory mark, and there we can't say uh, whether they it belonged to Schönwölkau or Schönwölkau or not. Well, then in the 14 rooms uh, of the castle in Lust time, they are exposed in, I think, 55 vitrines. From the beginning, we have stoneware and uh, early Meissen Böttger porcelain with the relief decoration on it. Yeah, here you have this very huge uh, glass cooler and other vessels, a wonderful um, tea caddy. Then early pieces on the right hand with the gold made at the Funke um, uh, workshop, interesting. Um, and uh, well, these pieces, these earlier pieces, um, and also the early Meissen given then or bought, uh, bought and uh, sent to Augsburg and decorated in Augsburg by silver by, by um, porcelain painters, two families are uh, known. Um, all these objects should come to the, into the first volume, the next volume of the uh, catalog about Meissen. And I'm working on this Augsburg decoration. We have three vitrines like this. Oops. And there are signed pieces with ERW, which is uh, Johann Aufenwert, one of the families working in Augsburg. And the other, the more, more famous family is the Seuter family, with these incredibly refined um, uh, designs on the gold made through uh, the different a grade of polishing you find in here. There is a signed uh, service um, in other places. And you have um, here the signed, um, the, the, the sources which are made after engravings of Hörold uh, dated 1726. So they must be made after that. And as they can be related to the gold service uh, where we had the date 1732, and there are some signed Seuter pieces 1736. So this is the period when they were produced in the 1730s. Then uh, most of all are the uh, uh, gold chinoiserie decoration on white porcelain, but there are also there's one this one. Um, coffee pot uh, with gold and a scene on it after an engraving, yes. Then more than uh, there are the earliest paintings when Hörold arrived and knew how to use porcelain uh, paintings, what Böttger was not able to do it. And we have these where the palette is not yet so uh, exaggerated and very typical for the early pieces are that the Clouds are very uh, thick <laughs> behind. Later on, you find less clouds. And you have also one um, a bowl for, for cleaning, with uh, which has different scenes on it and other scenes on other vessels of this tea and coffee service, uh, where you have scenes, for example, that this man is writing in his tent, writing a love letter to the lady who is uh, together with another man, unfortunately. And this lady gets then a baby and um, you see the putto of love uh, putting uh, the 
the corns of an animal to show that he is has been betrayed and at the end even a baby comes as you can see here on the uh, bowl these pieces are not in loose time but just to show that these early pieces early tea services really have a whole story on it and actually the man very much looks like well perhaps a, a certain person uh, at court in 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 Saxony. Well, then the other uh, very early piece is this tea caddy in loose time, which has the same decoration like in Krakow, but you see from the engraving that uh, they handled it a little bit differently, and it's interesting to compare. Well, then there is a whole vitrine where we attribute all the pieces to Herold himself. Uh, one reason, well, there is this wonderful uh, clock holder, and we can attribute to Herold through um, the uh, these huge uh, 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 piece of paper with uh, Shinrazeri scenes in the so-called Schulz Codex, where certain scenes like here can be found directly on the porcelain. Like as you can see here, in a, on a waste ball in loose time, or on a beaker in loose time, or and it, this is a coffee pot, and you see that the same scene has been uh, painted se se uh, uh, several times. And very much sure, I'm, which I'm sure that these uh, uh, saucer, this saucer, there are four of them, are painted by Herold because all the scenes you find are in the Schulz Codex. The first line, the three scenes, is one saucer. You can see the three sides of this one saucer on top. Inside the saucer is all gold. And outside, underneath, you have this painting that means when you drink the hot beverage out of the saucer, then your guest will see the wonderful painting, a very rare decoration, um, normally the, you have the painting inside the saucer. And the second saucer with this type of decoration you find in the middle row on the, on the paper and the third on the third row. So that is definitely that the Herold painted these saucers, then one of the collaborators painted, copied the design into uh, on this paper, in the Schulz Codex, in order that these designs could be used again for the next um, uh, tea service, for example, because these uh, objects would be sold or would be given away as a present. Well, also this wonderful, ex exceptionally teapot shows, and but also they used as um, engravings uh, to copy and change uh, change on on porcelain. Then there is also one sugar box of the famous service of the King of Sardinia, where from archival um, uh, material we know that he wanted the King of Sardinia um, that Herold painted himself. And for century, uh, for for decades, this uh, uh, sugar box, though the uh, Chinese Chinese scene is very little, was very famous. But some years ago, the whole rest of the service came out with a huge coat of arms and with huge scenes came out on the market at, at Christie's, I think, and it's bought by Torino, um, and it's uh, exposed at the Palazzo Madama. Well, there is also this wonderful um, uh, Bourdalou um, with erotic scenes or nice dishes like this, where you have similar ones in uh, um, Krakow. And there are some pieces which can be related to other painters, which is very rare because the painters were not allowed to sign. But this um, a saucer is signed, as you can see, in the um, on the chair of the lady in the middle there, it's P-E-S, so it's Ernst Philipp Schindler, with very typical with this nose, rather um, uh, uh, potato nose, you can say. 
and there are other pieces attributed to Stadler in this way, or to Löwen, Adam Friedrich vom Löwen thing with these fantasy animals. Uh, also, these pieces were attributed to Adam Friedrich vom Löwen thing, and also the vase on the left. These three vases have been restituted to Dresden because it was proved that these vases come from Dresden. Nowadays, we would not be allowed anymore, but um, some 10 years ago, it was restituted. Um, and the vase on the left hand side is very similar to the service, which comes from the Munich residence and was never in Lustheim and never in Dresden, or only when it was produced. Very similar. And so I compared, before giving back this vase from Lustheim to Dresden, the two vases, and I put them one to the next. And on the left is the one in Lustheim, which was give, is given to Dresden and exposed there now, and the right is the Mun from the Munich residence. And you see that um, Löwenfink must have worked these vases together because they are exactly the same. So he has really uh, um, uh, tried to economize uh, the, 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 the painting of the porcelain. Then some other pieces in Lustheim, these cassette with uh, tea service. And uh, also on this tea service, you see Watteau scenes. Uh, and these uh, Watteau scenes and other engravings were made by, uh, were this, well, uh, worked on by Claudia Bodinek in this two volume wonderful book, Raffinesse im Accord, where it shows porcelain together with its engravings. For example, this ewer with the coat of arms of Saxony and um, Naples, and uh, the Queen Watteau service, uh, it was a wedding um, present, uh, and, and you see that together with uh, the engravings, and you have from one engraving different scenes put on um, different cups, for example, and also they were copied in color or in green only, green camayu, and one engraving would uh, serve for many, many cups, many more cups with the same decoration. Then in Lustheim we have also the tabatier and other pieces I just show like this um, whole uh, vitrine with uh, coat of arms service and of course two vitrines with the coat of arms of Sulkowski, the first prime minister under Augustus III. Uh, we have these uh, chandeliers and also the Turin on a stand which is copied directly after a silver Turin by uh, Jakob Biller from Augsburg uh, part of this huge service um, made for Augustus uh, the Strong. Copied exactly, and we know that um, this, the silver was sent to Meissen. There are bills uh, of the shipping, and they were copied in Meissen for Sulkowski. And you see um, that the, our uh, example shows even the, 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 the feet of this terrain, they are copied exactly. In, in here in Krakow, on the right hand side, you have also a terrain. Uh, the handles were broken or, or did not exist anymore, and they were copied after our exit, uh, 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 our, our terrain in Lustheim Castle. And obviously, this uh, terrain never had the uh, feet. And uh, the sockle underneath, perhaps, because the, some of the sockles have come out on market at Bonhams recently. And then we were able to buy also the center, uh, the piece, the lemon basket, the central lemon basket of the Sulkowski service. It's not in Lustheim, it's not part of the Schneider collection, but it's now in the Bavarian National Museum. You can see that also the lemon basket was copied after the lemon basket in the silver service of Augustus 
uh, the third, uh, the, the uh, Augustus is strong. It does not exist anymore, but you have um, this old uh, photography from 19, taken in 1933, where you can see the lemon basket with the head of the lady, which has been copied. Well, Augustus III and Count Brühl were very important uh, commissioners for Meissen, of course, with the, uh, we have also two vitrines uh, with um, the Swan service, where you have also wonderful pieces. And moreover, we have the centerpiece uh, for Count Brühl made in 1737 with Indian figures. Uh, of the vessels um, for oil and vinegar and uh, mustard. And this wonderful uh, centerpiece, which is huge, uh, one and a half meter or even, even, uh, long at least. And there is a large centerpiece in Lust time. And there is a smaller centerpiece in Chicago where I was able to go to and to examine it, how it works together. And the piece in, piece in Chicago has a um, uh, mount, gilt mount from underneath. And if you compare the larger loose time and the Chicago piece, you realize that the painting is different, the decoration is different, and uh, the piece in loose time has no mounts. And the pieces do not really fit into each other so they had problems with firing as you can see when you look from underneath that with the saw they really cut out the inside in a, to to be able to put it better together well the um, mounting does not exist anymore but this is chicago it works well and I said already that the painting is different. The one in Lustheim has the decoration, which is also on the service of Count Holm, and the other one of Count Hennecke. Very strange, because it is a, a commission of the most important and most powerful Count Brühl. He would not have the same um, centerpiece for Count Hennecke. It has not the count court of arms of Henneke. Well, still a problem I'm thinking of and have not found a solution. But anyway, a service uh, in silver and also in porcelain then would always have different centerpieces, a smaller in the middle and, a, and two smallers uh, on the outer layer outlines and chandeliers. And so you can imagine that this centerpiece would fit together with the two elephant chandeliers we have in loose time, because they have the same mounts as the smaller centerpiece in lemon basket centerpiece in Chicago, the same mounts and also the same decoration with these little uh, trees, exactly the same decoration and the same on the stand. So they would really, they are born together. They were made together and they would, must have been on a table together. You can imagine these chandeliers together with smaller, but probably there was a bigger one in the middle, then the chandeliers and then the two smaller ones. So this is what I imagine. Not everything has arrived. Well, we have also court of arms with a count of Podewils. And at the end, I want to show you very few figures which exist in, in Lust time because Schneider collected most of all vessels and not figures, only animals. And therefore, also these um, uh, 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 symbolization of the four continents uh, Asia, Europe, um, Africa and America. The huge ones, there are also smaller ones. And also birds, he had a, a whole vitrine, full for whole vitrine, and also the monkey band, where you also have pieces in Krakow. Da, uh, pug dogs, of course, <laughs> he also loved them, like everybody who loved the 18th century, as they were so important at that time, and meaningful, of course.
and very very few items uh, figures like here the comedia the larger figure i put it here because i in, in the catalog of the meissen exhibition now in krakow i've written about the comedia de Larte. so i thank you very much for your kind attention and i can only ask you please come to munich to the bavarian national museum to lustheim castle and don't miss a residence either so welcome Thank you.